so good morning guys so today i'm going to talk about the remaining topics on the surgical conditions of the liver and they are a liver abscess okay, very important one after that i'm talking about high dotted cyst of the liver and then if time allows us then we'll talk about hepatocellular carcinoma and after that i'll move on to the intestinal pathology now see there in the last class also uh, i you know briefly talked about the surgical anatomy of the liver so let's revise once again liver is one of the big organ of our body okay one of the big and solid organ but not the biggest one what is the biggest organ of our human body yes skin skin, skin. very good excellent it's a skin okay but liver is also one of the big so liver is located in the right uh, hypochondrium mainly but it is also extended up to the left hypochondrium because it is a bigger organ especially the left lobe of the liver may reach up to the left hypochondrium <clears throat> look at the weight of the liver around 1500 gram okay and it is mainly divided into two lobe right and left so right lobe is almost three quarter of the left means right is much bigger than the left now look at this uh, you know picture first this is the right lobe of the liver and here is the left lobe okay the falciform ligament is uh, dividing you know arbitrarily this liver into the two lobes now these are you know coronary ligament these are folds of the peritoneum and they form the right and left triangular ligament so these are the different you know uh, ligaments of the liver which uh, acts as a, a suspensory ligament means they act like a support to the liver means they uh, keep liver in the in that place so see there right triangular ligament left triangular ligament and falciform ligament okay so right triangular ligament fixes the right lobe to the under surface of the right dome of diaphragm left triangular ligament is doing that on the left dome of the diaphragm and falciform ligament actually it is a remnant of the umbilical vein umbilical vein you have studied in fetal circulation is very very important you know blood vessel during fetal life but after the baby is born you know it doesn't have uh, the same purpose so uh, it will atrophy okay or it will disappear now the more important point uh, regarding the surgical anatomy is the blood supply if your teacher asks any question it is from the blood supply the liver okay receives blood supply from two sources 80% of the blood goes to the liver through portal vein this is the venous blood remember this and this portal vein you know has a different type of structure it has two sets of capillaries at either end one set of capillaries lies in the gi tract and another set of capillaries develop inside the liver okay so portal vein is connected by two sets of capillaries on either side portal vein is the middle on one side one set of capillary on other side another set of capillaries so this is the hallmark of portal vein and only 20% blood is from the hepatic artery hepatic artery is a branch of celiac trunk okay it's one of the main artery of the celiac trunk now, right branch of hepatic artery supplies entire right lobe and left branch supplies the left lobe so this again divide into right and left right there into the porta hepatis porta hepatis is a entrance to the liver okay you can say exit from the liver also but not all structure exit from there uh, so uh, you know we'll talk about that a bit later now what about the venous drainage of the liver this is done by three hepatic vein so these three hepatic vein are not present in porta hepatis though okay they are present on the supero posterior aspect of the liver they are right middle and the left so they join inferior vena cava immediately so the venous drainage is into the inferior vena cava and that inferior vena cava uh, takes the blood to the right atrium now remember uh, all of you have studied congestive cardiac failure okay or constrictive pericarditis in medicine 
and congestive cardiac failure was also taught in pediatrics. When right side of the heart is not working properly, okay, there is congestion of the blood there. So the blood will be, you know, there is a direct pressure developed backwards towards the inferior vena cava and then into the hepatic vein. So liver will be congested. This congestion is through the hepatic vein. So this is also important to know. Let's move on. Now, so these are the, you know, some of the anatomical pictures of the liver, okay? You can clearly see this is the inferior vena cava we are talking right now, okay? Uh, uh, these are the hepatic vein, which drains the blood from the liver into the inferior vena cava. Here is the right lobe, there is the left lobe, there is a falciform ligament. This is the gallbladder, you can clearly see it. Gallbladder, this is the cystic duct, okay? When cystic duct joins, the common hepatic duct, then common bile duct is formed. So this is the anatomy of common bile duct. See here. This common hepatic duct is formed by the fusion of right hepatic duct and the left hepatic duct. These are the two. There is the portal vein. You can clearly see this is portal vein. It will divide into two branches, left and the right. And this is the hepatic artery it will again divide into two branches, right and the left. This is called porta hepatis, this area. Now, porta hepatis is the hilum of the liver, okay? Hilum, hilum uh, means, you know, just like hilum of the lung, it's like an entrance or exit from the liver. It has the most vital structure within it are hepatic artery, bile duct, and portal vein, hepatic artery, bile duct, and the portal vein. These are the important structures present there. Now, a very, very important question from the exam point of view for the students is this one. Hepatojudinal ligament, also known as lesser omentum. At the free edge of the lesser omentum, these three structures are present. They are hepatic artery, bile duct, and the portal vein. Never forget this. Within the hilum, these structures divide into right and left branches, okay? Especially hepatic artery and the portal vein. This bile duct, uh, at that area, we call it common hepatic duct because it is formed by the union of two right and left hepatic duct. Bile duct uh, forms a bit below. Now, with this, you know, basic surgical anatomy, Let's enter into the today's topic, that is liver abscess or hepatic abscess. Please pay attention. Now, we all know what is the meaning of abscess. This is the collection of pus in a localized area surrounded by pyogenic membrane that is called abscess. And pus is the collection of dead neutrophil, okay, in inflammatory exudate, okay, and some necrotic tissue that is pus. So collection of pus in the liver of a bacterial, fungal, or parasitic origin that most commonly involves the right lobe of the liver is called liver abscess. You can simply say collection of pus okay, in the liver is called liver abscess. And later on, you can add that there are multiple etiology like bacteria, fungal, or even parasite. We roughly divide uh, liver abscess into the two types, pyogenic and amoebic because of the incidence. Pyogenic means pus-forming bacteria are responsible. Amoebic means inter-amoeba histolytica is responsible. The same amoeba which causes amoebic dysentery, okay, is responsible for amoebic liver abscess. Now, what are the causes of pyogenic liver abscess? How bacteria reaches there in the liver? Okay, this is a very important, you know, part of the lecture. The infection marries the liver through the portal vein. Isn't it? Portal vein takes 80% of the blood to the liver. Remember that. And most of the GI tract blood is collected and taken to the liver. So in case of acute appendicitis, the infection can easily go to the liver through the portal vein. 
Wow, why? Uh, can anybody tell me why in acute appendicitis, you know, the infection which is the liver? What is the root? So because uh, 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 through, uh, from the appendix, uh, there is a drainage of the blood through the portal vein into the <laughs> liver. That's why sir, there is infection. Sir, basically, yes. sir, majority of the IT, sir, sir yes, because sir. of sir, majority of the IT is drained through the portal vein, and this portal, this portal vein says the infection is spreading. Exactly, exactly. Okay, that's what I'm trying to explain to you. I uh, remember the appendix is one of the organ which is drained by portal vein. So, whatever infection is there, you know, it can easily leak into that blood and into the portal vein, and through that, it may reach the liver and it may cause infection inside the liver now. Acute diverticulitis. Diverticulum are very common to form in stigmoid colon, especially in older people, okay, diverticula. When they are inflamed, we call it diverticulitis. So they can also reach there. Acute amoebic colitis, acute bacillary dysentery, and even ulcerative colitis. So all of these are some of the causes. Now, infection through the common bile duct, structure of the CBD, periampullary carcinoma. Now, you have uh, you know, heard about this. It's one of the cancer which occurs around the ampulla water. And uh, if that causes cholangitis, then uh, through the common bile duct, the infection may ascend up towards the liver and can cause abscess. Recurrent cholangitis because of the stone okay, in the common bile duct, which is very common. This stone in the CBD is called cholelithiasis. It can give rise to recurrent cholangitis. Okay, this is an infection. And even while doing ERCP, the introduction of infection can happen if the uh, you know, instruments are not sterile. So these are the two important pathway of introduction of infection there. But there are few more. See there? Infection through the hepatic artery. In case of septicemia and pyemia. Now, septicemia is the multiplication of microorganism in the blood with signs and symptoms. That is called septicemia. Pyemia is the you know, presence of pus, okay, the infected material in the blood. So both of them can reach to the uh, liver through the hepatic artery. Another one is the extension abscess from the nearby area, from the nearby area. Now look at the example here, subdiaphragmatic abscess. This is abscess formation right below the diaphragm and above the liver. There is a space there. Below the diaphragm, above the liver, subdiaphragmatic abscess, it may extend into the liver. Impyma thoracis. Now, what do you mean by that? What is impyma thoracis? There is correction of pus in the pleural space. Mainly. Yes, pus in the thorax, thoracic cavity. Exactly. Exactly. Collection of pus in the pleural cavity or thoracic cavity, whatever you say, this is called impyma thoracis. So it may again extend into the liver. And vice versa is also right, you know, liver abscess may rupture and may lead to impyma thoracis. Some of the penetrating injury, like bullet injury, okay, knife injury, they can also lead to uh, abscess in the deeper area of our body. Now, infection through umbilicus is very common in case of neonate. In case of neonate. For example, if that neonate has got umbilical sepsis, then, okay, then through the umbilical vein, the the infection may reach the liver. Now, what are the microorganisms that they, they are responsible? Remember, we are talking about pyogenic abscess. So these are all post-forming bacteria. Majority of the infective bacteria are derived from the GI tract in this case, of course. Look at the blood which is going to the liver through the GI tract, okay? The portal circulation, collecting all the blood from the GI tract and taking it to the liver. Through the CBD, <clears throat> also, these, these organisms may ascend up towards the liver. So most of these are 
GI tract organism. So in majority of the cases, it is polymicrobial, more than one bacteria are responsible, polymicrobial. Look at the example, then you understand by yourself. Bacteroids fragilis is the most common anaerobe which is responsible for pyogenic liver abscess. This is anaerobe and it is the most common organism as well. It's 60% of the case. After that, it's E. coli and other enterobacterici family. Okay, E. coli and other gram-negative organisms, we can say, like Klebsiella, other gram-negatives like Citrobacter, Enterobacter, okay, uh, Proteus, and even Staphylococcus aureus is responsible for the infection. Sometimes even fungal infection may be, you know, causing the uh, abscess formation like Candida and other fungus, but they are more common in immunocompromised people or the patient. And different example you can give, uh, you know, for immunocompromised situation, like somebody is taking chemotherapy uh, while they are receiving treatment for leukemia. This is a clear cut case of immunocompromised situation because this chemotherapy is suppressing the bone marrow. We all know that. So there will be pancytopenia. Whenever there is neutropenia, this is an immunocompromised situation. Okay. We can also uh, give a lot of other example here. But let me talk some practical information to you first. In the beginning, we'll never think about fungal or other rare type of infection. We always think about uh, bacterial infection in the beginning. We use broad spectrum antibiotic and wait for the result. After 48 to 72 hours, those antibiotics must work, okay? I mean, patient should get better, a little bit better as also, if not completely. If nothing is happening, if there is no change, if the patient condition is rather deteriorating rather than improving, then a good doctor will definitely think, am I wrong? Is my diagnosis in doubt here? And then he will think about maybe this is a case of fungal infection. Now he will add one more broad spectrum type of antifungal drug, but may continue the antibacterial therapy. Now, can you tell me what are the systemic antifungal drug? Systemic. Amphotericin B. Amphotericin B. Very good. Very good. Amphotericin B or flucytosin, okay, fluconazole, uh, they are the different, but amphotericin B is very commonly used in the clinical practice. Let's move on. Now, what are the signs and symptoms of pyogenic liver abscess? Now see that this is an abscess collection in our body. So this is an infection in our body. So there will be fever. And this fever is high grade fever with chills and sometimes even rigor. Chills and rigor. Chills means feeling cold. Rigor means shivering. Most of the you know, abscesses are having fever of this type. There is insidious onset of right upper quadrant pain as well as epigastric pain. Remember, uh, usually right uh, lobe of the liver is having these abscesses. So pain is also localized to that area. But sometimes abscess may be present towards the left lobe of the liver. So even epigastric pain may be there. Jaundice is not very common in case of liver abscess because it is a localized collection of pus in one area of the liver. But it really depends on how badly it has uh, you know, obstructed the biliary channel or biliary duct, or how big area of the liver is damaged. So jaundice may be there or may not be there. In later stages, sepsis occurs. Now, when, that, uh, when those microorganisms okay, enter into the blood from the liver, sepsis can happen very easily. The person may have weight loss, okay? Person may have weight loss, hepatomegaly, okay? Hepatomegaly and amoebic abscess, if this is a case of amoebic abscess, then uh, the course is a protracted one, means a chronic one, 
amyloid liver abscess is a chronic type of abscess than the pyogenic one. Probably, uh, you know, sometimes patient may be a bit of asymptomatic as well, and it may remain there for a longer duration if treatment is not provided. Okay, let's move on. Now, regarding the uh, investigation, please mute yourself. What investigation you like to do, uh, you know, in a case of liver abscess? This is a case of infection. So I'll, of course, start with CBC, isn't it? You start with CBC. See there? So when do we do CBC? The total count will be raised. And if I do a differential count, what will be the result? Differential count? Yes. Neutrophilia. Neutrophilia with the rest. Exactly. Very easy answer. Neutrophilia. Because this is a bacterial infection. And this is an acute bacterial infection. So neutrophilia is there. Stool routine examination is done. Exactly. Exactly. You're right. Neutrophilia. Okay. Now, uh, after that, we go for stool uh, routine examination. Now, why is that necessary? See there. Sometimes, amoebic liver abscess is a strong differential diagnosis of pyogenic liver abscess. So to rule out amoebic liver abscess, uh, we can go for stool examination because the source of that entire amoeba histolytica is from the GI tract. And if we are lucky, we may get cyst of amoeba during the stool examination. So that is one very important reason you can give here. And another one, culture and sensitivity for typhoid bacilli. Sometimes it may be responsible for, you know, a infection in the liver. And typhoid bacilli is also, you know, first, it, it uh, you know, causes infection in the pears patches of the ileum. And it is also excreted in the stool. So these are the different reasons you can give. But frankly speaking, it is not that very important investigation in this case. The important one are abdominal ultrasound and ultrasound guided aspiration. It establishes the diagnosis. It is always done, ultrasound of the liver, and it will clearly show the abscess. And if you are still not sure whether it is pyogenic liver abscess or amoebic liver abscess, you can uh, do aspiration, which is guided by ultrasound. And that aspiration uh, so clear pus, then it is a pyogenic abscess. It that pus is like an anchovy sus appearance. We'll talk about that later, okay? In amoebic liver abscess, this is a special morphological appearance of pus in uh, amoebic liver abscess. This is called anchovy sus. That color itself will give us the diagnosis. Yes, this is a case of amoebic liver abscess. Now, when in doubt, CT scan can be done. If uh, ultrasound is not that confirmatory, we can always go for CT scan. And that is followed by fine needle aspiration cytology. After we draw the pus, this is a, this is a surgical and medical principle. Always remember this, okay? Don't discard this pus. Send the sample for gram stain and culture and sensitivity, always because it really helps you regarding the treatment. If gram stain shows us a particular bacteria, you know, that will really help us. And uh, more help is uh, we obtain from culture and sensitivity test. Now we talk this all the time, culture and sensitivity, but what is the meaning of this? I want to ask because I want to make sure whether students have understand this or not. Culture and sensitivity, anybody? Sir, it's a uh, test in which sir, we give up. Uh, the bacteria are uh, uh, sensitive to which type of drug? Uh, sir, may I explain? Yes, yes. Basically, sir, sir, in this, in a culture sensitivity, yes, sir, sir, we also know, like, like, sir, what is the culture? Like, sir, what is the bacteria or the germ that is causing? And, sir, by sensitivity, sir, we also know that, that the organism that is causing this uh, is sensitive to which certain drugs, sir. So, so, so sir, we... Uh, so, sir, we know both the things in this case. Exactly. All of all of the students, you know, I, I really got, though Irfan, you know, could not complete his answer, but I got his meaning. 
you know the meaning i just want to know whether you are getting the meaning or not okay very easy term actually culture you just get the sample and okay the microbiologist will try to grow the organism from that sample that is called culture the microorganism will be put into the different culture plate culture media that is culture now after growing the microorganism the microbiologist will check for antibiotic sensitivity test which antibiotics can kill that microorganism okay will cause the no growth of that microorganism this is called sensitivity test this is such a important you know test these days that will clearly tells us which antibiotic to choose for the treatment now city also okay, city also please uh, mute yourself city also helps in the diagnosis of associated condition like diverticulitis of the colon because this may be one of the causes of abscess there so it is uh, another helpful reason excuse me sir yes Uh, sir, uh, for culture and sensitivity, sir, it's uh, take time. Uh, uh, this test take time. Sir, uh, can we start uh, empirical treatment before the uh, result comes? Very good question, you have asked. Okay, excellent. We we never wait for the culture report. Okay, if we suspect this is a case of infection, we start our treatment. And in this case, especially in this case, I'm talking about. We are talking about. liver abscess this is a serious infection once you suspect uh, with a you know ultrasound for example ultrasound will show there is abscess inside the liver why to wait we straight away start broad spectrum antibiotic but we still send post for culture and sensitivity so it may take you know a 48 hour or 72 hour for the report to come back so after that we revise our uh, you know treatment is is that the same drug we are using or not whatever the sensitivity report says if the patient is improving if the sensitivity report is saying the same drug then we'll continue it if sensitivity report tells us to change the drug we'll change it okay this is the protocol you you, you don't wait uh, for that but there are certain other condition Uh, because you have asked this important practical question so let me answer sometimes the patient is not that sick or not that ill so during that time i may wait for the culture report that is another important point for example in typhoid fever okay you are suspecting typhoid fever but it is not confirmatory and you think patient is not that sick so you can wait uh, for few days till the culture report comes so it all depends on you know what is the clinical status of the patient if patient is sick don't wait straight away start the treatment and later on may modify it according to the report if patient condition is not that sick okay low grade fever or something like that you can wait for the report okay now now let's move on what are the other uh, investigation what are the further investigation here the further investigations are uh, directed towards the associated condition like chest x ray if if you suspect sub diaphragmatic abscess which is extending you know into the liver then chest x ray can pick that up chest x ray will show some shadow there you know chest x ray will show maybe the dome of the diaphragm is raised a little bit higher than the normal this type of information is provided another one if air under the diaphragm is seen uh, by chest x ray that means there is a perforation of hollow viscous inside the abdominal cavity or even diagnosis of impyema thoracis can be done with the help of chest x ray so it depends what condition you are thinking so chest x ray is one of the investigation we can include here now see there so this is the you know uh, ct scan Uh, which is showing pyogenic uh, liver abscess you see there this is a abscess you know site in the liver okay there is another one so abscess okay this is hypoechoic shadow hypoechogenic shadow in the liver 
because it is a pus collection inside the liver. So this is a this all whole organ is liver here. Now let's combine uh, all of the information uh, and uh, make a diagnosis of liver abscess. See this. So after clinical examination, taking a good history and doing physical examination, we do ultrasound. Ultrasound will show a mass there. CT scan of the liver can show multiple masses in pyogenic and single mass in amoebic liver abscess. Usually pyogenic liver abscess are multiple inside the liver, whereas amoebic liver abscess is usually single. CBC will show us leukocytosis and left shift, okay, neutrophilia, a bit of immature forms are also seen. If we do liver function test, okay, they may be deranged or they may be abnormal. It depends on the chronicity though. If there is a chronic type of infection, then albumin level can be low as well. And even there is high prothrombin time, but it all depends on how badly the liver is damaged. They may be normal as well. And serology can be done for amoebic abscess. Okay, we'll talk about that later. What type of serology? Actually, some type of antibody detection can be done for amoebic abscess. Now, what is the treatment? Now, first of all, uh, let me explain the surgical principle. Whenever there is a collection of pus inside the body, you have to drain the pus. And at the same time, you have to use antibiotic. Okay, so these are the two main, you know, modality of treatment here. Now, see this. Regarding the conservative uh, treatment, multiple abscesses may respond to antibiotics. However, they have to be given for long duration, like four to six weeks. Okay. Because this is a serious infection going on inside the liver. The penetration of those, you know, uh, abscess or those cavities which contains pus is difficult for the antibiotic. That's why the longer duration is necessary. Now, second is drainage. See this drainage. Okay. This drainage can be done by ultrasound or CT guided aspiration and drainage. We, we use a pigtail catheter for the drainage. This pigtail catheter means that special you know, shape of the catheter. It is a curved one. That's where the name is given. And after that, we irrigate the abscess cavity with a lot of normal saline. So basically antibiotic and drainage. Now, the third one is also a drainage. Okay, this is also a drainage, but this drainage is by open method, which is the surgical method. Okay, this is a big type of surgery because you are opening uh, the area there. Okay, see there, laparotomy is required mainly to treat the primary causes like appendicectomy or drainage of appendicular abscess. If appendicitis or acute appendicitis is the cause of liver abscess, okay, then you can go for this type of therapy because both, uh, you know, treatment can be done together. If liver shows a significant abscess, means big abscess, big abscess cavity, then it is drained by open or surgical method. Now, after that, we always put one catheter for the drainage for a few days, you know, because uh, after uh, uh, the surgical treatment, there may be some exudation, okay? Some necrotic material may still be there. That necrotic material should not collect in that area. It should drain outside. And that is done by the drainage. And the, another way is the laparoscopic drainage. This is also very popularly done these days. Uh, this is, uh, you know, a bit of easier surgery than the laparotomy. Uh, here only uh, two to three holes are made on the anterior abdominal wall and with the help of laparoscope you know the treatment is done now with this uh, let's enter into the another type of liver abscess it is amoebic liver abscess amoebic liver abscess so the causative agent here is inter amoeba histolytica now see this inter amoeba histolytica 
so what type of organism is this amoeba it belongs to which type of you know organism in in microbiology and parasitology what is the classification an anaerobic parasite sir parasite uh, parasite it is an anaerobic parasite or sir like uh, amoebozoans sir mainly okay this is parasite and parasites are divided into two big uh, you know it is divided into two big headings one is protozoa another is metazoa protozoa and metazoa so this belongs to protozoa protozoa are the you know type of parasite okay so your answer is right so it is also called a tropical abscess or dysentric abscess these are the synonymous term for amoebic liver abscess it is the commonest extra intestinal manifestation of amoebiasis principally or mainly is intaimba histolytica infects our colon okay it causes colonic infection first and from colon okay it may go outside the number one organ which is infected outside the colon is liver but liver is not the only extra intestinal organ which is infected remember that sometimes even brain can be infected by uh, you know amoeba so my spleen can also be involved so there is even lung can be involved so these are the other but most important one is the liver it is almost always a complication of amoebic dysentery so we should take a history of dysentery probably now or in the past this can occur in the acute stage or in the chronic carrier stage both acute stage means ongoing infection chronic carrier stage signs and symptoms are no more there only the organisms are there infection from the cecum which is known as tiflitis inflammation of the cecum is called tiflitis it spreads through the tributary of supermesenteric vein and it reaches the liver see that supermesenteric vein ultimately forms the portal vein that's why the blood reaches the liver and from sigmoid colon uh, it is through the tributary of inferior mesenteric vein inferior mesenteric vein directly drains into the splenic vein so again the blood reaches the portal vein so uh, this is the way intaimba histolytica or the trophozoic form of intaimba histolytica reaches the liver so remember the trophozoic form should reach the liver then only uh, they can do the extensive damage yeast is a resting form trophozoic is the active form in this case now we're talking about amoebic liver abscess here and uh, usually the organism that is inter amoeba histolytica reaches the liver uh, through portal vein okay through portal vein now see there some of the important points the right branch of the portal vein is bigger than the left and it is also in direct line with the portal vein so what does that mean most of the blood will flow to the right lobe of the liver through the portal vein so if some microorganisms are present in that blood the portal vein you know the blood which is inside the portal vein there is more chance of those microorganism reaching the right lobe of the liver than the left that's why there is more chance of abscess formation on the right lobe than the left so if somebody asks you this question why the right lobe of the liver is more commonly affected than the left we can answer like this number one right lobe is bigger in size so it receives more blood that is one reason another the right branch of the portal vein is in direct line with the portal vein and it is also bigger in size so uh, whatever microorganisms are there in the portal vein it they have a high chance of reaching the right lobe of the liver now, after there is the liver now see there what they do there the organism that is the trophozoic form of intaimba histolytica causes destruction of the hepatocyte by releasing powerful cytolytic enzyme it results in liquefaction necrosis so liquefaction necrosis can occur inside the liver it also causes a septic thrombosis of the blood vessel 
which results in necrosis of liver tissue. So aseptic thrombosis means there is no post formation now. Okay, without post formation, probably because of the extension of the inflammation, okay, from the wall of the blood vessel, there is thrombosis formation inside. Now after thrombosis, there is ischemia. Ischemia can lead to necrosis. So this is another way by which okay, the damage or destruction of the liver is done. But the more important way is uh, this cytolytic damage. So it is done by, uh, see there, it is done by the trophozoite form. Okay, let me write that here, the trophozoite form. Trophozoite form of entimba histolytica. Now, trophozoite form is the active form and cyst is an inactive form. Cyst is a resting form. There are two forms of entimba histolytica. So this trophozoite form will go there. At the same time, some RVCs are also broken down. There is one special characteristic feature of this trophozoite form of entimba histolytica. It can ingest RVC. Okay, it can ingest RVC. Okay, so during that process, the RVCs are broken down. Okay, there is a you know interaction between our immune system and this trophozoite, these RBCs. So uh, they are destroyed in this in that area. So this forms a special type of pus, and this is known as ankobi sauce pus because of the typical appearance of this. This is chocolate brown in color. Okay, chocolate brown in color, and this is known as ankobi sauce pus. So this is a mixture of broken down RBC some hepatocyte, the necrosed hepatocyte, and of course, okay, neutrophils and other inflammatory cells would be there. Let's move on. Now, if we, if we aspirate that pus and send for the microbiology culture, okay, in majority of the cases, the pus is sterile, means no microorganisms are grown. So this is a pure uh, case of amoebic liver abscess. But in some 20 to 30 percent of the cases, secondary infection may occur there. So what does that mean? It's a combination of amoebic liver abscess and then uh, pyogenic liver abscess as well. But that is uh, a bit rare, 20 to 30 percent only. These amoeba are rarely present in the pus. So we do not try to grow this amoeba there but they are present in the wall of the abscess cavity. The wall also contains different inflammatory cells like monocyte or macrophages, plasma cell and lymphocyte. All of these are example of chronic inflammatory cells. This clearly tells if the treatment is not done in time, you know, this uh, abscess can become chronic. And there is a fibroblast as well. Abscesses are usually single, but in the beginning, they may be multiple. Later on, they may fuse with each other to form a single large abscess. This is an important difference between pyogenic abscess and amoebic abscess. Pyogenic abscess are usually small and multiple, whereas amoebic liver abscess is single and a big one. Due to perihepatitis, perihepatitis means inflammation around the liver or surrounding the liver. The abscess gets fixed to the diaphragm, resulting in immobility of the diaphragm. It can happen. And because of the same reason, sometimes abscess may rupture upward into the right pleural cavity as well. So right-sided empyema thoracis is quite common in case of amoebic liver abscess. Now, liver abscess in the left lobe gets adherent to the anterior abdominal wall as well. So these are some of the problem because of perihepatitis. Now with this, let's talk about the clinical feature, how the patient presents clinically, what are the symptoms and signs. Now, one of the important point here is these patients are usually male alcoholic patient, okay, male alcoholic patient. Now, probably the reason for this these alcoholic patients, they don't, you know, care about their diet, okay? They don't care about what they are eating, actually. So probably there is high chance of GI infection in them. And whenever GI infection occurs, okay, if it is, especially if it is a amoebic 
you know, infection, there is a definite chance of liver infection. And one more reason, these alcoholic people are, you know, uh, immunocompromised, okay? They are immunocompromised. So there is more chance. This is seen in patients with low socioeconomic status. So again, uh, this is, uh, you know, explained by uh, the same reason. There is more chance of GI infection because of, you know, healthcare issues and all things like that. Now, regarding the main symptom, there is severe pain in the right hypochondriac area because there is an abscess, there is a pus collection there. And that abscess is causing enlargement of the liver. When liver is enlarged, the glycine capsule, which is covering the liver, is stretched. This is a very important mechanism for the pain there, okay? Glycine capsule is the capsule surrounds the liver. And when liver is enlarged, you know, that glycine capsule is stretched. It is uh, uh, supplied by the somatic nerve. So patient feels pain. This stage is called amoebic hepatitis. It is very early stage. If ultrasound is done in this stage, it may not demonstrate any abscess, but there may be many micro abscesses. These are very, very small collection of the pus here and there. But remember what happens later? Most of these abscesses will coalesce or fuse together to form a single big abscess. Okay, this is the hallmark of amoebic liver abscess. At this stage of amoebic hepatitis, okay, there is low grade fever, weakness, anorexia, etc. Now, these are very non specific features. Without severe pain in the right hypochondriac area, we cannot even think of uh, liver abscess here because this is very, these are very non-specific features. Now, after a few days, okay, there is high-grade fever with chills and rigor develop, especially if it is, you know, secondarily infected by some pyogenic organism. But even in case of amoebic liver abscess, the fever will become higher grade after a few days. And chills and rigor may be there or may not be there. It is definitely present if there is secondary bacterial infection by pyogenic organism. Some of the thoracic symptom or chest symptom like non-productive cough, pleurisy, and right shoulder pain are common. Now, pleurisy is pleuritic pain, okay? This is involvement of the parietal pleura that is known as pleurisy and right shoulder pain occurs because of pleuritic pain itself this is a referred pain all of these occur because of the involvement of diaphragm because the involvement of the diaphragmatic pleura let's move on so see there are some other important feature here okay now, anemia emaciation Toxic look and earthy complexion is present. So these are some other features uh, like anemia. Okay, emaciation means uh, you know weight loss, uh, especially in chronic cases. These all are uh, you know chronic uh, cases. Anemia and emaciation. Toxic look in any case of high grade fever, the patient looks toxic. Toxic means you know the red uh, appearance of the face. High grade fever, patient looks sick. This is called toxic appearance, very common term in clinical practice. And earthy complexion means patient looks a little, little, bit, little bit, bit pale, a bit of anemic appearance, okay? Now, jaundice may be present if abscesses are multiple. And this jaundice is because of compression of biliary radicals. Radicals means biliary channel, very small biliary duct. Remember, this abscess is present inside the liver. So inside the liver, there are smaller biliary duct, so they may be compressed. However, it is rare. It is of cholestatic variety. Now, what is the hallmark of cholestatic jaundice? Yes, if I do liver function test, what are the report, result? Anybody? It's a difficult question. 
AST or ALT elevated? Elevated, sir. Enzyme there will be major. BGT. Good. Now, see here. It is a cholestatic jaundice because it is uh, compressing the biliary duct or biliary radical. So, cholestatic jaundice means if I do the liver enzyme, the most important liver enzyme will be ALP, alkaline phosphatase, or GGT, gamma glutamyl transpeptidase. GGT is more, uh, you know, commonly raised in alcoholic type of you know, problem. So ALP will be high. Okay. They are high. Clear? They are high. But at the same time, the other liver enzymes can also be high. It depends on how bad the parenchymatous part of the liver is damaged. So they can also be high. But they are much more higher than other. This is one of the correct answer. And another one, is the total serum bilirubin is increased, okay? And at the same time, the direct component of the bilirubin will be high, the direct component. And that is, uh, you know, the conjugated bilirubin will be high. So this is direct component is high. So these are some of the important points you should never forget. And I'm sure, you know, you have already done this in medicine. Now, let's move further. Liver is enlarged in the right hypochondrium, tender and soft. These are the features of abscess. Intercostal tenderness differentiates it from acute cholecystitis, and intercostal edema can also be present. Now, this intercostal tenderness is uh, you know, detected by thumping. Okay? Make a fist uh, uh, from your hand and just hit on the lateral aspect of the right hypochondriac area and patient will complain a lot of pain or you can simply look at the face of the patient whether the patient is wincing or not. This is known as intercostal tenderness. In cholecystitis, it is not present because gallbladder is present anteriorly. Why? There will be pain when I thump laterally. So these are some of the important features. Now let's uh, investigate this case a bit, a bit like uh, you know, amoebic, uh, sorry, a pyogenic liver abscess investigation. Okay, uh, many of the things are a bit similar. Now see that we do CBC count, and CBC will show increased WBC. Okay, increased WBC and neutrophilia will be there, especially if there is secondary bacterial infection. Stool examination is very important here now because this is the case of amoebic liver abscess. So what we look in this stool examination, ova and cyst, okay, of in time by histolytica uh, is present almost in 25% of the case. Now, let me clarify a little bit. Probably this topic was not taught to you before. In time by histolytica can exist in two forms, trophozoite and the cyst. Now, in the stool, the trophozoite cannot live longer so detection of trophozoite is rare in the stool examination. Sometimes, luckily, we can see that, but mainly the cyst forms are present there. Okay, but the disease which we are talking right now, the amoebic liver abscess, is caused by the trophozoite form. The trophozoites are active form or the vegetative form. We say so they uh, invade the colonic wall. They reach to the portal circulation. There is to the liver and they do extensive damage there. But nevertheless, diagnosis of in time histolytica is helped by stool examination. That's the point. Serological testing can be done. Okay, The indirect heme agglutination test is positive in 90 to 95% of the patient with an amoebic abscess. So if facilities are available, this test can be done. Now, another one, is screening of the chest. When the patient is asked to take a deep breath, right side of the diaphragm doesn't move due to perihepatitis. Okay, Remember, perihepatitis is inflammation surrounding the liver. So there may be adhesion development between the right lobe of the liver and right dome of the diaphragm. So if I ask the patient to take a deep breath, the right side of the diaphragm doesn't move that much because of the attachment or the adhesion. So this uh, is a very simple, this is a, actually a clinical test. Okay, You can include this in a sign 
of liver abscess. But nevertheless, it helps us regarding the diagnosis. That's why it is uh, you know, highlighted here. Let's move on. Now, some other uh, investigation can be sigmoidoscopy. This sigmoidoscopy may demonstrate large, deep, amoebic ulcer, which are flask-shaped okay, in morphology. They are called flask-shaped ulcer, and sigmoid colon may be affected in case of active amoebic dysentery. Abdominal ultrasound is always done. Actually, it is the investigation of choice here. Now, what are the advantages or the benefits, okay, or the plus point of doing abdominal ultrasound in this case? See here, number one, it locate the site of abscess. Where exactly? Is it in the left lobe or the right lobe? Then we can go for ultrasound guided needle aspiration. Now, if we can do that, okay, we see ankovi sus type of pus. Ankovi sus type of pus. If we see that, then we get the diagnosis. At the same time, we can uh, take the biopsy, okay, of the abscess wall. And uh, sometimes we can detect the organism from there. So these are some of the important points regarding ultrasound. If ultrasound uh, doesn't give you uh, the necessary information, you can always go for a CT scan. Now see there, okay, so this is the CT, see this, how, how well the abscess is shown here. There's a single abscess, okay, single abscess and the right lobe of the liver. Now this is what ankovi sauce you know, or ankovi paste looks like. This is, okay, exactly, the color matches. This is ankovi paste. Okay, this is a type of food actually, okay? So uh, the color uh, looks same. That's why they have compared it like ankovi sauce or ankovi paste appearance. So never forget this important term here. Ankovi sauce pus or ankovi paste like appearance is seen in, in which of the following condition? The question may be asked like that and directly choose amoebic liver abscess as your answer. Now, what are the treatment now, treatment? So we have a similar type of uh, you know, treatment course here, just like pyogenic liver abscess. First is a conservative line of the management and second is the surgical one. Now, regarding the conservative line of management, we use anti-amoebic drug. Anti-amoebic drug. Now, can you uh, tell me the names of anti-amoebic drug? Matronidazole. Yes. Any other? And uh, we, we can use miropenem or carbopenem. Mm -hmm. And beta lactam. Like, sir, yes. we can also use Chloroquine, the, sir. We can use the, the nitrothiazole, we can use as well, sir. The, the thiazole derivative as well, sir. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, there are so many drugs which, can, which are listed, you know, in your pharmacological textbook, okay? Now, for the clinical point of view, we don't want all of them. So, few of the important drug name I'm going to highlight here. The most important of them is metronidazole, okay? Metronidazole. Another drug is a, uh, you know, anti-malarial drug uh, that is called chloroquine. Chloroquine is also used in the treatment of amoebic liver abscess. Now, imatin is another drug which is used for the treatment, imatin, okay? And sometimes even, uh, you know, to treat or to eradicate uh, the, uh, you know, intima histolytica from the GI tract, even diloxanide purate can be used. Diloxanide purate to, to eradicate the cyst forms. Now, now let's come to the point here. Uh, it is indicated in amoebic hepatitis. I mean, the conservative line of the management, we can uh, prescribe metronidazole okay, three times a day for 14 days. The only recognizable side effect of metronidazole is metallic test in the mouth. We all have taken this drug before. 
So we know what is the side effect. You know, it is not good, uh, you know, feeling at all. And it is very, very difficult to complete the course of this drug. Okay. Very difficult because of this side effect. But we have to counsel the patient well. This is a serious infection. So patient should complete the dose. If the condition doesn't improve, then injection imatin, okay, this is imatin. Imatin is used. Uh, this is the alternative here. Now, just like, you know, uh, the previous uh, condition that is uh, pyogenic liver abscess, we can go for drainage, okay? This is how drainage is done. Ultrasound guided needle aspiration or pigtail catheter drainage. So we have to remember a few things here. If a large part of the liver is damaged, you need to do bleeding profile test, okay? Before you go for the aspiration or pigtail catheter drainage because you are damaging a part of liver here. If bleeding profile is not normal, then the patient continue to bleed after you do this procedure. So this is bleeding time, this is clotting time, and this is prothrombin time. In the beginning, okay, CBC is always done. We have done that already. Remember, platelet counts are normal, for example. They are normal. So bleeding time is normal. If platelets are normal, bleeding time is usually normal. After that, you just do CT or clotting time. If clotting time is also normal, then we, we presume everything else is normal. But if clotting time is prolonged, then you can go for PT and APTT test. So I have already taught you about this approach. Now see there, okay? Injection vitamin K should be given for at least three days if there is some dearrangement in this bleeding profile. Otherwise it is not necessary. What is the role of vitamin K there? Uh, sir, basically, sir, vitamin K is responsible for four clotting factors. The factor number two, seven, nine, and ten, and plus the protein CNS also vitamin K is responsible. So that's why, sir, we give the vitamin K in case of any like uh, like any chance of bleeding or, uh, or, or any, any, any bleeding disorder is there. Good, good, good. Very good answer. Very good. So vitamin C, uh, sorry, vitamin K dependent clotting factors are there, like two, seven, and nine, and ten. Uh, you know the activation of those factors. Uh, needs vitamin K. Without vitamin K, they cannot become active. So there is a high chance of development of coagulopathy, especially if liver is already damaged. So that's why, okay, this type of therapy is given. Ultrasound guided aspiration is also the treatment of choice where metronidazole is contraindicated, like in pregnancy, especially in the first trimester. Ultrasound is can be can be safely done in pregnancy. It is not like X-ray. This drainage can be done under local anesthesia. It can be repeated if post recollects. Okay, and it is uh, you know uh, giving us the diagnosis also. Typically, the color of the pus is anchoviscous. And after the uh, aspiration, uh, we should insert the pigtail catheter there. And remember. This is important for the drainage of the remaining, you know, exudate or the pus. It is kept there for a few days and later on removed. Now, another way of removal of the pus is surgery. See there, surgery or the open drainage, or it can be done through laparoscopic way also. The indications for this, this is a bigger surgery. So there has to be proper indication. The indications are failure of ultrasound guided needle aspiration and ruptured amoebic liver abscess with amoebic peritonitis. The second one is a very serious issue. So without any hesitation, uh, you know, laparotomy should be done, okay? And then uh, uh, a thorough washout of the peritoneal cavity is done with a removal of all the remaining abscess cavity. So this is a, you know, a emergency situation here. Now we have come towards the end of this uh, important topic. What are the complications of amoebic liver abscess? Okay, so this can be asked as an important question as well. Complication: One is amoebic peritonitis. If the pus 
or the abscess cavity gets ruptured, then the pus leaks into the peritoneal cavity, which is known as amoebic peritonitis. So all the features of peritonitis and septic shock will be there. Patient will have severe abdominal pain. There will be guarding, rigidity, and loss of the bowel sound. This is a feature of peritonitis. And patient is usually in shock. This is a septic shock. It has to be treated like any other peritonitis. Now, what we do in the beginning, we resuscitate the case. A lot of IV fluids given because patient is in shock, remember that. Immediately start IV antibiotic and take the patient into the operation theater for laparotomy. This is emergency laparotomy. Drain the pus, okay. drain the abscess cavity, okay. And then wash the peritoneal cavity thoroughly and then close the abdomen. So this is an important type of treatment. Another complication may be rupture of the abscess into the pleural space, resulting in pleural effusion first and later on impyema thoracis. In the beginning, pleural effusion, later on impyema thoracis. Now, if it directly ruptures, you know, this pleural effusion is impyma, there's no doubt. But sometimes what happens, there is perihepatitis formation, there is addition between the two structure, and, and then the inflammation may, you know, uh, migrate towards the pleural cavity. So it is an exudative type of pleural effusion. Later on, it may turn into abscess. It may rupture into the bronchus, resulting in coughing out the ankyloviscous material. This is one of the you know cause of bronchopleural fistula. See this bronchopleural fistula. Now, if this happens, then this uh, amoebic liver abscess will be naturally cured because the pus has already drained outside from the rupture. But at the same time, another complication is developed in the patient that is fistula, fistula between pleural cavity and the bronchus, and this bronchopleural fistula is an important cause of pneumothorax as well, pneumothorax. See that air can, can go easily into the pleural cavity through this fistula and the treatment is usually surgical now. Another complication can be amoebic pericardial effusion. If the rupture occurs into the pericardial space, and this mainly occurs in the uh, left liver lobe abscess. Cases have been reported. So these are uh, some of the complication of amphic liver abscess. Okay. Now, what about the prognosis? What about the mortality risk? See here, mortality is low for uncomplicated abscess, but complicated abscess carry a 40% mortality risk. And complicated means all these complications which we have just listed, rupture into peritoneal cavity, rupture into the pleural cavity, rupture into the pericardial cavity and things like that. Now, this is a very complicated issue and there is a 40% mortality risk in this type of situation. So what is the lesson we learned? Uh, these are quite common disorders, especially in our part of the world because amoebic dysentery is very common. So if any patient comes to you with pain in the right hypochondriac area with fever, think about liver abscess as one of the differential diagnosis. This is the take home message. It may not be the only case, but it is one of the cause definitely. And we have to take a good history. We have to do good physical examination with proper investigation and can reach to the diagnosis. After diagnosis, treatment can be done easily, conservative way and the surgical way. So with this, uh, let me stop this topic. Okay, so at the end, I like to uh, request you all to like the video as much as possible, share it among your friends, and subscribe to the channel so that it will encourage me a lot for the future videos and recordings. Thank you so much.